this is the agenda for today. We're going to start out with some introductions, a quick program overview, and then we're going to go through some information on how to get on the roster and uh, what happens when you are invited to compete for work, um, and then what to expect after, if you're selected for a contract, what to expect next. And then we'll just um, do a quick review and wrap up. So let's get started. First of all, I'm Julie Megley Watska. I am uh, part of the Purchasing and Contract Services Department. Um, I also primarily in that area work on special projects and communications and some other things. So I've been helping um, as part of the team to develop this new program. Um, the project's been a collaborative effort between Purchasing Department the Office of Budget and Finance, and Engagement Services. And so throughout this presentation, several of my colleagues will also be um, doing some of the presenting and they'll introduce themselves as we go through the, the presentation. Just wanna start out by saying, um, purchasing mis purchasing's mission is to partner with vendors through a process that's cost-effective, fair, and accessible to all businesses and organizations. The county strives for diversity and inclusion in contracting, and we seek vendors who share our commitment to equal opportunity and affirmative action. Um, the use of requests for bids or requests for proposals and other competitive processes is how we ensure that our selection of vendors will be fair and transparent, as transparent as possible. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to um, Kelsey to introduce herself and then to talk a little bit about the engagement services philosophy. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kelsey Dawson Walton and I am the division manager for engagement services. Um, and this um, is a new, fairly new division over the last couple of years. We've been growing and building um, and this, our strategy, I just wanted to talk about our strategy and a little bit about why we why we wanted to and we felt it was very um, important to partner and to provide um, uh, more accessibility and uh, ease to, um, to getting to know what kind of opportunities are available within Hennepin County around community engagement, what that looks like. And, you know, later they'll we'll talk about kind of what kind of what kind of services we're talking about when we mean community engagement. But I just wanted to, you know, it's rooted in the foundation of relationships. We want to build relationships, continue to build upon relationships that we have as a county. Um, that's our strategy that aligns with our county's mission, vision, core values, and of course our work um, with reducing disparities uh, throughout Hennepin County. Um, our philosophy is around being thoughtful and strategic when it comes to engagement, and this is part of that. So we're able to really um, understand, you know, bring forward a kind of a full, the full spectrum of, of the work that Hennepin County does and the opportunities. And that really we're intentional about it and it's done um, kind of with the head and the heart, um, being able to, to work that through and, and ensure that communities um, are represented in our um, projects and policies and initiatives and the really the approach is around um, being intentional and listening um, and 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 when there is an issue that we problem solve together um, and you really that what we've been able to to build throughout this is listen um, to listen and then engage and respond and you know I would say you know due to the pandemic when it first break, broke out and um, as a result of the murder of George Floyd, um, it became really even more apparent than ever that we need to make sure that um, residents have, you know, accurate and timely information, access to resources and opportunities within Hennepin County. Um, and during that process, when we were talking to people over the last couple of years, a lot of the people we talked to, organizations, partners, let us know that, um, you know, they've never really either worked with government agency or maybe a little unfamiliar with the contracting process. And so um, 
a lot of times historically when we talked about when engagement would happen in projects, they were done, you know, primarily as separate initiatives um, with different divisions and it's not always in a coordinated manner. And so this is really what we want to do is really create this more more user friendly and uh, mutually beneficial approach to community engagement through contracting. Um, and so that's um, what you're going to hear today around, you know, um, kind of what that process looks like that we're being really intentional that you if you know your organization chooses to and we hope so um, as part of this program that you really self-identify communities that you um, serve um, whether it's geographically or culturally because we believe that we know that you know when you're in community and, and um, represent um, various stakeholder groups that that you know that you know our communities know the best way to kind of engage and be proactive in ensuring that there's strong representation um, with that. Uh, thanks very much, Kelsey. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the program itself and give you a quick overview. Um, what we're doing with this program is we're creating a roster of organizations who provide community engagement and outreach services and that are interested in working with Hennepin County to engage communities who are most affected by county initiatives. Um, county staff will be able to see a list of the organizations who and the, and the services that they offer. And so when a need arises, um, they'll be able to go to that list and invite the organizations who, um, offer the services that they need to compete for a contract. Um, organizations sign one contract with, that has all of our overarching legal terms to get your name on the roster. So there's an application process and then that leads to uh, what we call a principal agreement contract and we'll get into that a little further here in a minute. Um, Once you're on that roster, then you can be invited to compete for a contract when the need arises. If the organization is selected for an opportunity, they'll sign a shorter contract that has the specific details of the work that's needed to be performed. Um, it includes the scope of services, payment information, and deliverables and goals for the project. So what are the benefits? to joining the program. Um, it's an easier and faster contracting process. Um, the legal terms are only signed one time, which saves time. Um, there are reduced contract requirements based on the types of services that we're purchasing. So things like the insurance limits have been lowered. Um, and county staffs can find your organization. Um, by having this list, we know who is out there in the marketplace and what types of services you provide. Um, so that was a request from our county staff as something that they needed in order to be able to purchase these types of services. We have a program site. Um, this is out on our Hennepin.us website. Um, if you are looking to apply for the program or you just want more information on the program, there's a, a link on this slide and we will we will be sharing these slides with you. There's a link on this slide that gets you to the um, community engagement roster program page on the Hennepin County website. Julie, we have a question in the chat and yes. it is, how do you define organizations? Must they be nonprofits? Would any business registered with the state be eligible? Any business is eligible. Um, it doesn't matter if you're a corporation or if you are a nonprofit or an LLC. That doesn't make any difference. You guys can, um, anyone can register. All right. Um, before we get started in this presentation, there's some terms you're going to hear today that may be new to you. And so we want to make sure that we um, give you some information on what those terms mean. Um, one thing I also want to add that's not on this slide is that um, we as a team, a group, 
um, use some terms interchangeably, and that is community partner, organizations, vendors, and contractors. You're gonna hear us use those terms interchangeably. All of these terms refer to the people and organizations that are on the roster. Um, so I want to talk about the term principal agreement. You're going to hear us say that. That's the um, contract that I was talking about that has our overarching terms and conditions um, that govern any future, future work orders. Um, one thing that you should know is this principal agreement does not guarantee work for the organization. What it, what it does is it gets you on the roster so that we can um, invite you to compete for um, opportunities that come up. And so you still, there's still a piece of competition. It's just a, a smaller um, group of organizations that would be competing against each other. The roster is basically the list of the community partners in the program. Um, as I mentioned, you get on there by completing the application and you're not actually added to the roster until after everyone who needs to sign the principal agreement has signed it. Work order contract, that's the shorter contract with the requirements for a specific project. So if you're selected from the roster for um, to work with us on a project, then you would sign a work order contract. It's pretty short, it's about two pages. Um, it has the uh, nuts and bolts details of the actual project. Um, and it is still associated with the principal agreement. So you have to still follow everything that's in the principal agreement, but the work order will give you the specifics to the project. Uh, scope of services. Um, that's the description specifically of what services the county needs. And request for proposals. Um, you might be familiar with those RFPs. Um, it's basically how you compete, how community partners compete for a work order contract. Julie, we have a question in the chat. And the yes. question, do we have the contract in other languages like French? We do not. At this point, they are in uh, the only language we have on the contracts is English. I think we can look at if there's a need getting translations, though, because we do have translation services, of course. So yes, correct. Um, supplier portal is the county's electronic system for where you post your bids and RFPs. One of the things I wanted to add about the request for proposals is that um, they are posted. It's a non-public posting of the um, of any RFP that's related to this program. Um, just means that the only people that would be invited to respond to a proposal would be would have to be uh, on this roster. All right, next I want to cover the end to end process. It just shows us the entire process from the time that you fill out your application to being hired to perform work. Julie, we have another question. Yep. Will vendors on the rosters receive notifications of all RFPs or only those that are relevant to the vendor's interests? Only well, the way we have it worked out right now is that we no. are. Hello. I think somebody is uh, unmuted. I, if you could please uh, mute yourself. Um, I, Julie, I can answer that. I think many of them will go to all the vendors, but if there are people that only speak certain languages or serve certain populations, we may narrow that list at, for, for some RFPs. Thank you. OK, I'm going to move forward. End to end process. Community organization, you submit your application and you sign the principal agreement. Once you've done all of that, the county adds the organization to the roster. The county, um, when a county department 
has a need for community engagement, then they will um, issue an RFP in the supplier portal to the organizations that are on the roster. Julie, we have another question in the chat. OK, it's it's will you be sharing examples of projects, contracts, RFPs that will come out? And I'm wondering if we can call on Kelsey or Danny to give examples of community engagement services that we've um, required in the past. Just a few examples. Yeah, hi, Danny Lee here. So um, some examples are like, for example, trust and messenger contracts, uh, which we uh, have those organizations that uh, help with, you know, Providing accurate timely information for COVID and vaccination testing, et cetera. Some of the past been like, for example, the county contracts go like gun violence. Some are storytelling. Some are, you know, helping plan, um, you know, engagement planning or engagement training. So it, it could be <clears throat> anything out there. Um, for example, last year we have elections. Uh, so uh, different types of contracts. Thank you. Thanks, Danny. We have another question in the chat. Is there a minimum requirement for organizations to be on the roster? And the answer is no. Um, all right, so back to the end to end process. The pro program manager is going to issue the RFP in the supplier portal. That's that RFP again is just going to go out to people who are registered on the on the roster. Um, community organ organizations then submit their proposals in response to the RFP. The county evaluates the proposals and selects the winning organization. And then the county and the organization both sign the work order contract. The county then issues a purchase order, or a PO for the um, to the vendor and the vendor begins work. So that's the, the process from start to finish. Um, now we're going to go into some of the details on each of these different sta stages. So first of all, how do you get on the roster? The first thing that you need to do is um, complete the community engagement roster application form. Once you've completed that form, um, then that comes directly to us and we take a look at the application. So what you want to do is make sure that you complete all of the required fields. Um, they are indicated with an asterisk. Um, make sure you indicate all of your capabilities and populations served by checking the appropriate boxes. And I'm going to show you what this looks like in just a second. You can get an e you'll get an email confirming that the county received the application form, and then you'll also get an email from um, the program manager in the purchasing department to just let you know that we got your application and to let you know what the next steps are. So I'm going to show you what the application looks like. OK. So what I've pre-populated some of the information in here so that you don't have to sit and watch me type everything. But I just want to show you when you go into the application, all of this stuff will be blank and you'll you'll just start filling it out. Um, I want to point out that you'll see this little red asterisk um, on these next to whatever has to be completed. So if you leave any of those uh, required fields blank, you will not be able to submit the application until you actually finish um, finish those items. So first of all, you start with this tab. This is the first tab that's going to show up when you um, enter into the application form. I checked no on here to the question, do I have an existing contract with Hennepin County? So you'll notice that I have a W-9 form tab in here. If I had already been doing business with Hennepin County, so I checked yes, that I do have an a contract with the county. You notice that W-9 form goes away. It's only needed for brand new um, organizations working with the county. So then I, if I check yes here, you'll notice I get a second question, which asks me, are there any changes to my organization, such as name change, address, or change to the business structure? Again, this is a required question. 
if I check no, there's no W-9 form still. But if I check yes, the W-9 form pops in because that's how you report your changes to the county. Um, and then it just asks for my general information. My or organization's legal name, what you should be putting in here is your name that you have registered with the Secretary of State, so the state of Minnesota. So we're looking for your legal name, um, not a doing business as name. So keep that in mind when you're filling this out. The state you're incorporated in, most of you are gonna be Minnesota, some are others, but you can choose from the drop down box, your phone number, and then do I have a website? So I clicked no on here, so I can just keep moving on in the form. If I clicked yes, this box is gonna pop up and you just put in your organization's website. Contact information, we wanna know who has authority within your organization to sign contracts. And that name should appear right here with their email contact information. This is where the contract will be sent if you, um, for your principal agreement in order to get signed. So this is an important section right here. If you have somebody else who does, uh, would answer billing questions or information about insurance, you wanna enter their names here. If it's the same person as the person who has signing authority, you can click this box and it automatically populates, populates the information. So you can see here, um, We've got one question about new project opportunities. If I click that, so that's the same as the signing authority, it'll just populate it for me. So this is the portion that we were talking about when we're talking about um, what services you provide and um, like who, what populations you serve. Um, you can click as many of these as apply to your organizations. Um, Please only the select the things that you uh, actually are capable and have availability to do. Um, so you can see on mine, I clicked three different, I picked three different things, but you could click them all if they all apply to you. What am I a topic expert on? Again, you can click as many of these as apply. If there's only one, there's only one, and that's fine too. And then communities you serve. So I selected a few communities on here. You will notice that if you click on African immigrant, uh, you'll get some additional information here to uh, nail, nail down exactly who you work with. Um, so we kind of try to, to target in on, on what the exact population is that you work with. And that applies for African immigrant and Asian Pacific Islander and then languages you provide services in. And those are listed here. And then districts you serve. Um, now here you have the option to click just the individual ones. I selected three, but if you work everywhere in Hennepin County, you can click all districts and they'll on automatically check the boxes for you. So I'm gonna go to the next page. The next page now is my W-9 form. Um, Again, we need you to go ahead and fill in information. Um, if you have a business tax ID and you click yes, then your business name you need to enter again here. Um, if you're a single, uh, single member LLC or sole proprietor, then you answer some more questions there. Uh, we need your tax ID number. Which didn't pop up, did it? I miss it. All right. Well, you you do enter end up entering that number of employees. Um, this is the address where you would want us to send your checks, uh, any um, billing information, checking information, and tax forms. So that needs to be filled in as well. And then um, order address, you can check that here. If it's the same as above, then you don't have to type it in again. 
The other thing that's on this page that might be of interest to you is the direct deposit information. Um, if you would prefer to have direct deposit and you click on the direct deposit box, you'll notice up here that now we have another tab that showed up for direct deposit. And you can put your banking information on that direct deposit form. Um, I'll go to that form next here. One of the things I just wanted to note about the direct deposit is that that can speed up getting your payments to you because they'll go directly into your bank. Um, so for those of you who um, are looking to get you know, paid as quickly as possible, which I guess most of us always are, right? Um, that's This is one way to do that is to, to sign up for direct deposit. And then the next page on here in this one, you're going to you're going to see this demographic information regardless of whether or not you're filling out the W-9 form or anything else. Um, this is information that Hennepin County collects to see how we're doing on contracting with um, um, a diverse group of contractors. So we're looking for information to say, are we how are we doing? Uh, we're trying very hard to be um, fair and, and have opportunities for everybody. And so this is sort of what we're using in order to, to keep track of that. If you check any of these boxes, publicly held company or a nonprofit or a government entity, you'll notice that the demographic information goes away. If you're any other organization and you check all other, then these, these uh, four questions will pop up here. The first one, are you a certified small business? Um, if you're not familiar with the CERT program and you're not certified, that's fine, check no. But I would encourage you to use this button on the side with the little question mark and check into um, what it means to be certified for small businesses as a small business. Um, that can create some opportunities for you, especially with contracting within um, Hennepin County anyway. And then they'll ask about being veteran owned. I'm gonna check no, I'm gonna check that I'm a female and I'm gonna check white Caucasian. And then I'm gonna move on to the next form. Um, this final one is just acknowledgement and signatures. And so uh, basically you just have to answer these three questions. If you cannot answer all three questions, there is a phone number up here. Please call that number. It does not go to the purchasing department or to engagement services. It goes to our financial area. So because they're the experts on these um, requirements and they can help you to figure out how to fill this out. This is the same number that you would call if you had questions on the W-9 form. If you didn't know how to fill out something on the W-9 form, you can also call this number for assistance. So what I want you to know about this page is that if you don't check all three of these um, questions, this submit button will continue to stay gray. It will not turn to blue until you check all three. So if it stays gray and you haven't checked all three of these and you don't know how to answer these, then make that phone call and have somebody help you walk through it. Um, this part, you just have to fill out your regular information. Um, you can use the email that I already entered and you'll be asked to sign this. It's an electronic signature. If you push the brush and then just put your name in there. Um, that's done. If I try to submit this right now, because I've left a lot of things blank and that are required, um, I will click the submit and you'll see everything that I didn't answer that has to be answered is shows up in red. Uh, you'll need to go back and fill in all of that information. Now this took me back to the W-9 form, but what I recommend is that you check each tab to make sure that you filled in everything on each tab. And you can see the W-9 I didn't, direct deposit I didn't, demographic information I did that one. 
acknowledge and sign. And of course, this one, I've got more red fields too. You have to have all of those red fields entered before you can actually submit the application and it will actually go through. I did want to remind everybody to ensure that you are, uh, all your information is current with the Secretary of State and that you're active with the Secretary of State. We will check that before we enter, put you on the roster. And so you need to make sure that you are have done everything with the Secretary of State. So when we go in there and check, you're going to come up of, as active and in good standing. Uh, Amber, were there more questions? Yes, there are a lot more questions in the chat. If we are on the roster, will we have access to the roster? And the answer is yes. We are going to post all of the organizations in their in the on the roster and what specialties they special areas they serve, languages they speak, all of those, um, all of that information will be in a report that we're going to post on the program page on Hennepin US, hopefully within the next month. Um, also another question, um, will organizations on the roster be notified when RFPs are added to the portal? If not, what is the mechanism for knowing an RFP is posted? If you're invited to the RFP, you'll get an invitation email and all of the RFP documents will be attached to that email. And so you can actually take a look at it without going into the portal to see if you're interested in responding to that RFP. Another question, is there any way to have RFPs sorted by the services we provide rather than having all RFPs sent to everyone um, or any of the information we enter? And I think uh, the intent is to only send it to people who can provide the services we need. So if you if we need it in a specific language, we're probably not going to send it to you if you don't bark that you speak those languages. I don't think we intend to send every opportunity to everybody on the roster, but we'll be making choices based on the information you um, give us in the application. And um, the last question we have is it might be used and it's more of a comment really, but it might be useful to stage a Hennepin County open conversation town hall meeting on community engagement strategies and efforts. Do we really need to compete for these projects? Might we act as an advisory arm or a collaboration cohort? Um, and I would say I think there'll be both. I mean, sometimes there'll be many organizations who can provide the services, so competition is just making it fair so everyone has a shot. But I think there will be many opportunities where we're going to award a, a work order to many organizations so that we can have many different folks, uh, organizations act as advisory arms. And I can um, open it up to Kelsey or Danny to comment on that further, but I think we will have um, multiple award contracts or contracts where we directly select organizations to provide services. Danny or Kelsey, did you want to add anything on that? Yeah, I mean, I responded to Michael. I, you know, I think that's a great idea. You know, I, I do think we need to do uh, have that conversation and that, you know, like I think you're pointing out, this is one strategy for community engagement. Um, and we know that there are many other strategies. This is just one way um, that we have heard from the feedback we've received. Um, contracting is kind of just one way to, to um, address how to kind of start to get more people and more communities involved in Hennepin County to shape um, the work really. And, you know, we do have a program in Danny Lee who manages it is on the call called the Trusted Messenger Program. And that is really very similar to what you're saying of some, some type of an advisory arm and collaborative um, cohort of sorts. And he can speak more to that. But, I, I, you know, I think, Michael, that's a great idea. I think we should, um, for engagement services as a whole, be out in community to talk about the various strategies and um, and what works because I know and I know you have a lot of things that you've done um, have a long relationship with Hennepin County on different projects too so um, yeah okay um, we had one more question in the chat and does an organization submit only one application to be on the roster even though they have multiple locations or embedded in multiple communities in the county and the answer to that is yes I, I do believe or we've tried to capture those things in the application. 
So you should be able to select the multiple locations in the application, um, or you can even say that you serve all seven districts. Um, but if you if you have a need to let us know more information, there should be some um, blank spots where you can add in information or you can always email us to let us know where the application needs to be modified. OK, I'm just going to pick up here. Um, when you submit your application, there will be an email that bounces back to you to say we got it. Um, and then the, a copy of the. Application is attached. OK, so the first step was to get an application submitted. The second step is going to be to review and sign the principal agreement. So the principal agreement um, contains all of the county standard terms. We talked about that. It'll be valid for five years, which keeps you on the roster then for five years. Um, insurance amounts have been um, reduced a little bit, as we mentioned, to be a little less burdensome. And then I wanted to just note that the proof of insurance is not required until you are selected for work. So just because you have the, the principal agreement doesn't mean you have to run right out and get insurance at these levels if you don't already have it. Um, it just means that once you are selected for a job, we will expect you to be carrying these amounts of insurance. So that's hopefully um, a little less burdens burdensome for everybody. We are currently so having all of the um, oh, contracts signed electronically. You don't need any special software to do that. Um, you can just view and sign the agreement. Uh, you can even do it on your phone. An email will be sent to the authorized signer in your organization, and then that has a link in it to sign the principal agreement. And then just as a reminder to everybody, be sure to review the agreement before signing. Um, once you sign it, you're committed to it. So we want to make sure you know what you're signing. And now I'm going to turn everything over to Vanessa Van Orden, who is going to do a demonstration of Adobe Sign so that you know what you need to do in order to sign the document. Thanks, Julie. Uh, my name is Vanessa Van Orden, and I work uh, at Hennepin County in the Office of Budget and Finance, and I help support this, our electronic contracting system. Julie, do you want to go to the next slide? Thank you. So I'm just going to walk through some screenshots of how to sign an agreement electronically. Um, and you will receive an email, as Julie mentioned, when the contract is ready for your signature. It will look like it's from Hennepin County Purchasing, but the email will be adobesign at adobesign.com. And it will look like that screenshot below, more or less, that it will ask you to please sign contract and it will have the contract number and a short description. If for some reason you don't, um, you're expecting the email and you don't see it, you might wanna check your spam folder. Uh, sometimes I have seen that the Adobe Sign emails might go to a spam or junk folder. Once you open the email, there will be a link to uh, in the email to review and sign the agreement. So you just click the link. You'll need to click a continue button to accept the terms of use. And then the agreement will open. So as Julie mentioned, you do not need any special software. Uh, as long as you have an internet connection and a web browser, that's all you and an email address, that's all you need. The agreement will open in a web browser. If you want to review it or download the agreement to send to someone else to review before you sign it, you can do that. There is an options drop down menu in the top left of the screen that you can click and that will give you some options, including downloading to PDF. When you're ready to sign, you will see a start tag in Adobe Sign and you can click that and it will take you to your signature block. You'll click in the box to enter your signature. Depending on how you're signing, whether you're signing on a desktop or laptop computer or a mobile device, the it may default a different option. If you're on a desktop or laptop computer, it will default to type in your signature. So you'll type your name and it will choose a, a font for your signature. 
You can um, change it though. So there's, I've highlighted above, there's um, the ability, you have the ability to draw your signature using your finger on a touch screen or a mouse. Uh, you can upload an image of your signature if you have one um, that's saved to your device. And if you're on a desktop computer, there's also a mobile link and that will send a message to a mobile number where you can draw your signature on a phone or mobile device and then it'll send it back to the computer. Um, if you're signing on a mobile device, it will default to the draw method where you can draw your signature, but you can also change it to type or any of the other options if you choose. Just to note that if you type your signature, then you're typing your name, you only have to do that once. If you're drawing your signature, you will also need to type your name. Once you've entered your signature in your name, if applicable, you will click the apply button. And then there's just one more piece of information we need, which is your title. So you'll click in there and uh, type in your title. And then once you finish entering all the required fields, uh, you should see if you're on a desktop or laptop, it'll come up in the lower right corner. There's a blue click to sign button. If you're on a mobile device, it will have a tap to sign blue button that comes up. Once you finish signing, you will be taken to a confirmation page that lets you know that you have finished signing the agreement. After um, the organization signs, it does go back to the county for additional county signatures. Once everyone has signed the agreement, you will receive an email with a PDF attachment of the fully signed agreement for your records. We do have instructions um, that you can access for how to sign um, in Adobe Sign if you need additional help or screenshots or instructions. And that should be in the email that's also sent to you from the program manager when, you know, before they send out the agreement for signature, they'll send an email that will have a link to that. This is Julie again, so I'll take over from here. Thank you, Vanessa. So the next step then is to is going to be to get registered in the supplier portal. Um, the supplier portal, that's our system that we use for um, contract opportunities. So RFPs and bids all go into that system. When the county needs engagement work, we will invite roster members to respond to an RFP in the supplier portal. Um, again, for, for RFPs that are associated with this pro this program, um, we will only be inviting people who are already on the roster. You'll receive an email from the program manager when it's time to register in the in the supplier portal. Um, and you have to be registered in the supplier portal before you can submit a proposal. I just want to add that if you're not already registered in the supplier portal, some of you may be and that's fine, but if you're not already registered, I would encourage you to wait until after you have um, your principal agreement in place. It just makes the registration a little bit easier. All right, and we do have a lot of help um, support for regist while you're registering in the supplier portal. You can um, go to our supplier portal help page. There's a video on registration that you can follow. Uh, we also have people manning a phone line that help with um, supporting the supplier portal. Um, and you can see they're available Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And then there's also an email address if you prefer to just send in your questions. Again, we wanna, uh, we're gonna do a demonstration of registering in the supplier portal, but before we do that, I wanna cover a little bit of terminology. Um, event is a term you're gonna see and that is for online posting or invitation to submit a response to a county contract opportunity. Um, there are a lot of public opportunities. The ones that we would be submitting under here are going to be non-public and by invitation only. Um, bid is a term that's used throughout all events to refer to a response to an event. So. Um, you'll see that oftentimes when you are um, need to take action on something, you might see a button come up that says bid on event or submit bid. And then supplier, 
that's the term used for the organization or, or any vendor that's doing work for the county. Um, sometimes you'll see that again in the portal when you're needing to take action on something. So examples include um, supplier change request is to update your organization's information. And I'm going to turn it over to Stacy to demonstrate um, the supplier portal. Stacy, um, you can just take over sharing the screen. Okay. Um, so as Julie had stated, um, for this step, it's important to wait until you get that email from the program manager telling you to go ahead and register with the supplier portal. Um, when they send you that email, it will have the link directly to the supplier portal and also um, a link to the video training or uh, tutorial on how to register. But I'm going to show you um, how you can navigate directly starting from the Hennepin.us site and how you can get to the supplier portal from there. So here I am on Hennepin.us and in the search box, I'm just going to type supplier portal. Do a search. And it's this first link that's going to come up, the Supplier Portal Help page. And this page we have built to store all of our help information, our documents and our videos, but it also, and it also has our help desk information. But here is the link to visit the Supplier Portal to go directly to the Supplier Portal. So again, when you get the email from the program manager, it should have the link to get you directly to the supplier portal, but this is another way to get there as well. So this is what the public supplier portal page currently looks like. This is um, our actual live events. When you're coming out to register, the first thing you're going to do is click on this login or register link. And now I'm actually gonna bounce out to a test environment so I can show you that process. So this is our test environment. You land on the supplier portal, you're gonna click login or register. And so you will land then on the sign in or sign up page. And so the very first time you're coming out here, you're not gonna sign in, you're gonna do the sign up now. And then it's going to prompt you to fill in some of these fields. And the first thing is the email address you want associated to your account. So you plug, you type that in, and then you're going to hit send verification code. And so the system just emailed a code to this email address. So you're going to go now to the email, your email inbox. And you'll see an email from Hennepin County with the verification code. You'll open that up, copy the code, and then come back to that um, sign up page. Paste the code and click verify code. So now at this point, you've verified your email. Now you need to set up a password for your account. And then given name is your first name and surname is your last name. Once you have those filled out, then you're going to hit create. And then you're going to land on a page that looks like this. So you've completed the first part of that registration and now you need to do the second part. So you're going to click here. And it's going to prompt you for your tax ID. So I'm going to enter that. So. And because you did the application process, and all of that, you and you have that principal agreement, you are going to already exist in the system as a supplier. So you'll see this radio button with supplier. And then it pulls in some of the information that you already keyed. Um, the only remaining required field is going to be your telephone number, which you'll have to populate. But if you have any of um, additional information for these fields, please go ahead and populate those. Um, for this example, I'm just going to skip over those. And then the next thing we want you to do is we want you to look at the terms of the agreement for registering with the supplier portal. Um, and you can scroll through that. And you'll hit return. And then you're going to say, OK, I agree to those terms. I'll check that box. 
And then you're going to get this pop up box. And what it's telling you is that once you hit the submit button, it's going to um, put you back on that sign in and sign up page. So don't be surprised because now it's going to ask you to sign in. So I'm going to click OK. And then I'm going to hit submit, but I'm going to grab this email first. And then I'm back on that sign in or sign up page, but I don't need to sign up now because I've already done that. This time I'm going to sign in. And now once I sign in, I'm going to see <clears throat> my supplier ID in the upper left hand corner and my company name. So I know I'm signed in and then the page changes a little bit slightly. You'll have some additional options. And at this point now I can start clicking on the different events that I see and choose whether or not I want to um, submit a response. And I'll just quickly show you. So like this example here, when you click on it, um, here's the event details. But if I want to see any of the attachments associated to this particular opportunity, I'll click the view documents and then I'll see here's all the various attachments and I'll click view and then they'll open up and I can review them. And I can click OK. And if after reviewing this information, you do want to submit a response, then you would click on the bid on event. And then it will change slightly and you'll answer any of the questions, attach attachments it requests, and then you can submit it. Um, another thing I wanted to show you that somebody had asked about is um, when you are invited to one of these opportunities, you don't have to, and you've already registered and you've done all that. Um, if you are, you get an email for an invitation when you've been invited to an event. Um, so you can look at all the event information is here and all the attachments are here. So right here, you could review all the information and determine whether or not this is an opportunity that you're interested in. So it doesn't require you to go out there. And uh, I believe that is everything I wanted to show you about the supplier portal. Oh, uh, a couple of notes, though. I just like to say once you are invited to an opportunity and it is something that you want to participate in or submit a response, please don't wait until the end date daytime. Um, because in case you have any issues or questions with your submittal, um, we want to make sure that you have plenty of time to contact the, the help desk to help you get through it and make sure it gets submitted on time before the event ends. Um, and please don't don't hesitate to reach out for help um, if you're struggling with any part of the, the process. All right, let's talk now about getting work through the roster program. OK, the next thing that would happen is once you're on the roster, um, we would issue an RFP in the supplier portal. The county somebody in the county would identify a need for engagement work so that an rfp would be posted in the supplier portal the only roster applications would be invited to submit proposals the rfp uh, will consist of two parts um, one of those is the standard terms of participation uh, these are the rules that apply to all RFPs in the program, and then the scope of services. And those are, that's the information that is, tells you what is unique to that particular project and describes the specific work and deliverables that we need um, for the project to be successful. Documents related to the RFP are also attached in the event details, and they can be viewed by clicking on view documents. And then as Stacy just showed us, you can also view those documents um, because they're attached to the invitation email. High level steps, you would receive the email invitation to the RFP. Um, make sure that you review the important dates. Uh, for example, pre-proposal meeting, proposal due date, and the time that the proposal is due. Second step is to review the scope of services. Um, Make sure you're capable and available to do the work. Uh, we want to make sure that you can comply with all of the requirements and can perform the work. 
before you respond to the proposal. Step three is to draft the proposal, um, then tailor it to the scope, review the evaluation criteria carefully, attend the pre-proposal meeting if applicable. Um, not all RFPs will have a pre-proposal meeting, um, but if they do, they'll typically be held in a community where the services are needed and often it's at it like a public library. Um, we recommend you go to those to get all the information on the on the RFP. Step five, submit any questions in writing by the deadline specified in the RFP. So questions can be asked at the pre-proposal meeting or via email to the program manager. Um, after the questions due date, answers are posted in the event and emailed out to everyone. Um, that's just to keep it a level playing field so that everybody has the information available to them. Make sure to review any changes to the scope posted before your proposal is due. And then questions asked after the deadline, just so you know, might not get answered. Um, so make sure you're staying on top of that stuff. And then step six is basically to just go in and submit your proposal in the supplier portal. Um, there is a help document for submitting responses to an event. And this is linked to that document. So if you need assistance, it's probably also available on that um, supplier portal help page that Stacy just showed you. Best practices for drafting your proposal. Uh, biggest thing is plan ahead. Uh, preparing the proposal can take a while and requiring completing documents outside of supplier portal. So you could also possibly run into technical difficulties that could cause you to miss a proposal submission date. So please plan ahead and don't wait till the last minute to do your submission. Review the deliverables, allowable expenditures, reporting outcome measures, and the evaluation criteria carefully. You wanna make sure that you're addressing um, all the requirements that are in the proposal. And you wanna be sure that you are showing how your organization and your work uniquely fulfill the goals of the community engagement project. Um, proposal content should follow the order of the requirements in the RFP. And then again, you wanna differentiate yourself and your proposal from your competitors. So typically general marketing and sales literature may just detract from your solution that you're offering. We're really looking for what you can do um, for the county or with the county, um, and then try to be as creative with it as you can and, and have it not appear as just a canned response to every proposal out there. Evaluation of proposals, de department staff will receive the vendor responses after the solicitation closes. So they, um, they get them all at the same time. Um, they're evaluated based on the evaluation criteria listed in the RFP. Uh, keep in mind while you're, while you're doing this that when we do the evaluation process, we're gonna be looking at the non-cost criteria in the order of performance, I'm sorry, of importance, which is how they're listed in the RFP. So um, those things that are listed first, like planning for performing services is gonna be uh, weighted more heavily than say the quality of the proposal because that's the final co non-cost criteria. And then cost will also be reviewed as part of the evaluation process. If you're selected for a uh, work order contract, what do you need to know? You might have to uh, provide some additional information or documentation, and it would be requested via email by the program manager. This is an example of what an email to you might look like. Um, the substitute W9 could be requested if, if something has changed um, since you originally filled out your principal agreement, but otherwise that 
may not be something that we would need right away, but we will need insurance. Once you're hired, then we would want to have a, an insurance certificate completed by your agent. And we want it to display that Hennepin County is additional insured and Hennepin County should be listed as a certificate holder. All right, signing the work order. Um, the work order contract will be created and it will contain the work order reference number. Um, it'll have on it the contract number for the organization's principal agreement. It'll have the start and end dates for the contract service, dollar limits specific to the project, and it'll also have an attachment that has the final scope of services. So basically the expectations for um, performing the job you're being hired for. And the work order is, once it's all complete, it's emailed to your organization to be signed. The signing process is the same as, uh, it's also done in Adobe Sign, just as um, Vanessa demonstrated earlier. And this is just a, a snapshot of what the work order contract would look like. Um, you can see up here in the corner, there's a work order number and the agreement number, and that agreement number is your principal agreement. So you are held to um, abiding by all of the terms in both of those documents together. So the next thing that will happen is you'll receive, um, after the work order is signed by everybody who needs to sign it, you're gonna receive a purchase order. And the purchase order number, um, is important to keep hold of. Um, you need that for uh, putting on all of your invoices too to make sure that you're paid promptly. The county contact might also contact you to request that you start performing the services. <clears throat> and then you might wanna consider setting up a kickoff meeting with your county contact to make sure you start off on the project with good communication and that um, you know exactly what's expected of you and what steps you're gonna take. Best practices for contract performance. Basically, be, pre be prepared to get started and perform the work. Um, communicate openly. If you have questions about something or need clarity on anything, um, ask for clarity if language or terms are unclear. We we want that open communication. Um, we want to make sure that everybody's on the same page and we want you to be successful. And so, yeah, part of that is, is making sure that everybody understands what the expectations are. Be responsive. If you are asked for something from someone from that's working on the project, I had a county needs a report from you or they need a update or be responsive, um, get back to people. Uh, keep in mind, we are uh, looking for teamwork and collaboration. Um, we're in this together and we, the county is not successful if you're not successful. And so we want to keep the lines of communication open and, and collaborate. And then make sure that you are adhering to the scope, schedule and budget. Getting paid, everybody wants to receive their payment for the work that they've done and rightfully so. So make sure to put the purchase order number on all of your invoices. Um, remember that if you are doing anything that would involve uh, taxes, Hennepin County is exempt from state and local taxes. Submit your invoices quickly. Um, so stay on top of that. We like to see those in a timely matter, manner. Um, Enroll in direct deposit if you want to receive your payments faster. We talked about that before and, and how to do that based on the W-9 form. If you um, are already set up with Hennepin County and you do not currently have direct deposit, the way to do that is to just go in and fill out another W-9 form and then select the direct deposit information on there um, so that you can get that changed. You can email your invoices to um, the email address listed. 
And if you want to learn more about getting paid or have some questions, you can go to the Getting Paid page on the Hennepin County website. Key takeaways. Organizations on the roster can will be able to compete for engagement services contract opportunities. And those opportunities are limited to people who are on the roster. Get on the roster now. Um, we can, county departments are gonna be able to start using the program in just a couple of weeks. And we want as many names on that roster as possible so that you don't miss out on any opportunities. <clears throat> Being on the roster is not a guarantee of work. Um, competition is still required. I did forget to mention that at some, there are some times when um, competition may not be used. That typically happens in a situation where there's a, a, a unique service or only one vendor who can provide a certain service. In those cases, we could be using a, a, just a direct select process. Uh, but in most cases, um, competition is the default for the county. And don't forget, we're available to help. Um, we have a lot of resources to help. If you have questions, let us know. We'd be happy to answer your questions. And then this slide just has a lot of the key contacts. We've um, talked about a lot of these already. So we've got the supplier portal help page in here. Purchasing, in general, you can reach us at contracts at hennepin.us, but for this program, um, we have an email set up directly for to the program manager, engagement roster at hennepin.us. And then engagement service, um, engagement services has their own site with some information about engagement services, and the training materials will be on our program site. Um, we are putting that together. And so those should be there within the next couple of weeks as well. <clears throat> Any more questions? I just, I do have one quick question. Um, when you say, you know, there's a section that you would fill out that said expertise. And I'm curious, are those, I mean, you know, there there's, parts of each one of those that there may be like an area of expertise. Is that just a way to filter out the the individual RFPs and then we can decide if whether or not we're qualified within what each specific, you know, organization is looking for or what the, what the county is looking for within that? That's um, exactly right. Okay. That's exactly right. Um, here, you have to decide once a, an invitation goes out if it's in a category and and you read that um, scope of services and you know that that's not in your wheelhouse, um, then just don't respond. Um, so it, it's really kind of up to your organization at that point to look at it and say, well, I, I could do this or I or this is not something that I would do. But the categories just help us to try to get um, to just reach out to the to people who are interested in that particular general category. So it's better in general to check something that you have experience within, even if you aren't necessarily like the expert in the in the state or something like that. Yes, yes, I do think that's true. And Amber, you can correct me if you think that that's wrong, but um, I think what we're trying to do is get get a big pool and then have you decide when the scope of services comes up, if that's something that your um, agency is capable um, and available to respond to. Yes, you had it right. And uh, Katie said, perfect, thanks in the chat. So I would, I agree, be over inclusive in the categories. If you've got some experience in there, I would check the check that box. Any other questions or information that we Need to share. You know, it, it seems that um, violence prevention um, within the city of Minneapolis has been doing some comparable strategies um, and formulating, uh, identifying 
and formulating alliances or partnerships that might uh, be important to talk with them uh, and uh, use uh, use their information system to de deploy this opportunity, but to really actually build on some of the work that they've already done around com uh, community engagement that especially grew out of the pandemic and the murder of George Floyd. Seems like you're both kind of on the same uh, same church, two different pews. Thank you. That's true. Good information. Well, if we don't have any other questions, um, I'm going to wrap things up and just tell you all thank you so much for participating in this presentation. We were happy to give you information and we look forward to seeing you on our roster. <laughs>